and welcome to a uh, possibly rather underwhelming edition of Ben's Junk. Not that there could ever be such a thing as underwhelming Ben's Junk. But then again, sometimes the items can be a tad underwhelming. And indeed, this is one of those rare occasions where I'm going to tell you right up front, I cannot demo this. This isn't even the complete unit. Uh, this is only the front part of it, and that amounts to maybe the front third of it, if I had to guess. So anyway, this is a Zenith Phone Vision box, and this is from the final incarnation of Phone Vision, uh, where you needed outboard gear to watch Phone Vision. So anyway, let me back up a little bit here. I'm probably going to be going in two or three different directions with this. Try and stick with me here. Uh, just to fill you in briefly, back in 2015, I did an episode called Prehistoric Pay-Per-View. And it's one of the most famous archive episodes. I, I think it's in the top 10, at the very least top 15 most viewed. And it's about all these things that kind of led up to pay-per-view as we now know it. And the first segment of that episode, and the longest one, is on Zenith Phone Vision. And Zenith was using this name for 55 years. But uh, for the purposes of this discussion, in 1931, when TV was still very much an experimental thing here in the States, 10 years before we had our first commercial TV station, Zenith was already trying to foresee the future. Uh, they were trying to figure out, is TV going to be like radio, where it's ad-supported, or is it going to be like going to the movies, where you pay per view? Get it? And, well, you know, it, it, it wound up being a little of both in the long run. But, if nothing else, this pointed the way towards pay-per-view as we now know it. So anyway, it was uh, really the 50s by the time Zenith properly got to test this concept out. And the only semi-lasting stab at it was the final one in the 60s, which lasted for most of the decade and only in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, over WHCT, Channel 18. I, I forget what the current call letters are, but it's not that anymore. Anyway, uh, that lasted until early 1969, and almost like kind of a cruel joke, the FCC cleared phone vision for full national use, you know, a proper rollout, not too long thereafter, and they could start doing it at the beginning of 1970. Obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, Zenith always lost money on this whole phone vision thing. And by the 60s, it was totally outdated. Even though it was, you know, the whole pay-per-view concept, the way that it was handled, it couldn't handle color. So everything had to be black and white. And the movies that they ran, at their absolute most recent, were two years old. And I think by the time the 60s rolled around, they were running much older movies than that, trying to intentionally keep them black and white, but there's so little information on just the day-to-day -day stuff that I can't confirm that. So anyway, this is uh, one of the Hartford, Connecticut boxes. This was made in January of 1966. This apparently went to somebody's home. I've got the original box here for this part of it. This would have been in two boxes initially. But uh, I don't think he ever used it. This thing is, uh, it hasn't been stored the best. There's some, uh, I'll point it out, there's some discoloration, weird stuff going on, the chrome in spaces. But it looks like this just did not get used. And uh, yeah, this uh, wound up back at WHCT. And there's a photo that appeared in prehistoric pay-per-view, and I'll cut it in here of the basement of WHCT, where there were just stacks of these things kind of disembodied. So uh, the reason that these things are, in case you haven't gotten the hint, so crazy rare now is that they got parted out. They got sold to an electronic salvage company. And it's just dumb luck that a few of these things seemingly have survived. Uh, there are only two that I know of, of the 60s incarnation. The Early Television Foundation or Museum, whatever that's called, has one, 
and there's only two pictures of that thing, but that one's at least complete. Uh, the pictures aren't very good. They're pretty old. They're pretty heavily data compressed. And then we've got my front third of one. And so I guess I should discuss how I came to acquire this. So in really fairly recently, I got a private message on Facebook from a viewer uh, who sent me a Fleabay link for this thing saying, had I seen it? And, and no, I, for all the running Fleabay searches I do, Zenith Phone Vision was not actually one of them. I had I never had any great hope of finding any of that stuff in the first place, and I'd truly long written it off by, you know, just a few months ago. But uh, I looked at it, and it wasn't complete, but it was 20 bucks and 20 some odd dollars for shipping and all that. So I spent more on the shipping, true to form. But I just had to pick it up, uh, if only so there could be a little footage of this thing out there, so I, I could take some good photos of it, and I will end this video with a photo montage. And yeah, so even if I can't demo this, even this, if this is just strictly an academic thing, uh, it just, it feels like something I need to make. And uh, indeed, this is going to go in my very, very small collection of items, like just three or four items that I hope one day will wind up either in a museum or with some really hardcore collector, you know, that has the huge home and has the, like, each room set up for a different decade. So this would go in the 60s room and have whatever 60s gear that you could hook up to it. 60s TV, 60s stereo, and whatever else. Maybe get really uh, adventurous, you know, and put in a skip field open reel video recorder in there too. But, um, yeah, that was kind of the idea here. I, I just didn't want to see this thing go to the landfill. So, with that... There is very little for me to run down here. Now, by the time the 60s version of Phone Vision came around, Zenith had kind of dinked around with how they did this. So the name Phone Vision is obviously no accident. This was partially delivered by Phone Line, and it seems to be how they kept track of billing, and it was $1 per movie. Adjust that for inflation. But uh, by the time the 60s version came around, I may have gotten this wrong in the prehistoric pay-per-view episode, but I mentioned that you'd get a paper list of whatever movies, but you'd have to run through some sort of weird decoder, almost like, a I don't know, a little orphan Annie decoder ring or something, or just a, a little thing with a, if you remember those pieces of paper with the oddball ink, I forget what it's called, where you'd place it under something red, like red saran wrap, and it would expose whatever you were trying to read. Maybe something like that. But I think it was simpler. I think they just sent you a proper list with some codes on it for whatever movies. Here's the movie, here's the time, here's the code you need to punch in on your phone vision unit. And so, with that, I'll go ahead and open this up. And uh, yeah, I am propping this up with folded up post-it notes. There's only one foot on this. The other feet were on the rear part, so this thing is very floppy as is. But if I open it up, and if you look on the chrome, if the light hits it just right, um, it, it is a little off. It's not necessarily just my fingerprints. I did try to clean this off, and a lot of it is just like uh, corrosion. Uh, some very Hopefully I was able to stop it, but uh, some early signs of rust starting to happen, but hopefully I was able to keep that from happening. But anyway, up here, the, and this is why I'm going to have a photo gallery, uh, we have our, what, four digits and, uh, excuse me, three digits and a letter and a button to punch in what you want. Now, this is where the back part of this would have come in handy. I can hit this button all day long and nothing's going to happen. This seems to just be decorative, this brown bit here. It doesn't seem to be connected to anything uh, totally solid. But, uh, yeah, so you'd punch in your movie somehow, some way with this. You got a fine-tuning knob here. And just to hammer home that this is indeed the Hartford, Connecticut version, and I will put in a proper photo later. 
the very first instruction is turn your TV to channel 18. So yeah, this was made with a very specific market in mind. Uh, basic TV, pay TV switch. That's really all there is to it. I think all the fun stuff was in the back. So anyway, if I try and turn this thing around, I, I was considering trying to open this up, but I think I would probably destroy it. It's not just screws, but there's some rivets and some other stuff in here, and I don't want to potentially ruin any of the wiring, not that anybody would able, ever be able to test it at this point. But uh, it, it seemed to be tube driven. We got the sockets for it or some adapter for a tube, I guess it could be, but I'm gonna guess just tube driven. And that's about it. Uh, when I press that one and only button, if I can open up the front again, right at the tip of my finger, you can see where it would be communicating with something in that big rear part of this. But anyway, uh, we got the date stamp, which is upside down. You'll see it in the photo gallery. And yeah, there's just not much to go on here. This is uh, truly an academic thing. So anyway, I do have the original box, one of the original boxes as it were, and apparently they called this front part of it a translator. Now I don't know, this uh, S60388 appears elsewhere on the box, but I couldn't tell you if that's a serial number or a model number, but I'm gonna guess, if nothing else, they called the front part of this the translator, which, which would make sense. I'm sure there's some voodoo going on in that uh, main unit that I showed. But anyway, it's kind of hard to read at this point, but it does have somebody's name on it, George Holm. And well, we have part of an address here. I think uh, between the torn off address and the PO box for a return address, I think we're safe at this point and this being almost 60 years old. Um, yeah, so we do have a little bit of this surviving. Now, all, all this marker stuff, I don't know if this is, uh, I think this is from 1966. Two of two, that would make sense. So one of two would have been the big rear part of it. Anyway, uh, we have one other instance of that number and name. And I, I should note, in all fairness to the seller, this was double boxed. They did not try and send this ancient decrepit box through the postal service. But anyway, once again, we got a date. We got K39, which also appears on the back of that unit. Uh, but if you can look through where it says TV tuner here, we actually have the address for WHCT. So part of me thinks that Later on, this may very well be part of that stack that appeared in that photo that was taken in the early 70s when WHCT was really just kind of abandoned. Uh, I think they were still on, but it was very reduced. I think it was just a few reruns and not much else. I'd, I'd have to look into that a little more. Or if somebody knows their Hartford TV history, feel free to fill me in. But anyway, that's really all I have to show here. Again, I can't demo anything, but it just, it felt like it needed to be discussed. So with that, I'm going to shut up here. This is going to be it for me on the vocal front today. I will leave you with my photo gallery and I'll talk to you again soon.